Welcome to the podcast. I'm Angela Bobier, and this is Life in the Talbot Settlement, brought to you by Tircano Heritage Society and Bacchus Page House Museum. In this series, we will do our best to give you a full appreciation of the history of Western Algon County in southwestern Ontario, from First Nations through the original European settlers to the 1950s. I'll cover one topic per episode, with the first eight setting the tone for who we are, where we are, and what we do here at Bacchus Page House Museum. Please follow us on all social media by searching at Bacchus Page House, spelt B-A-C-K-U-S, P-A-G-E-H-O-U-S-E. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Today we will be talking about the arrival of the railroads in Dunwich and Aldborough townships, specifically how these trains forged many of the modern communities including Rodney, West Lorne and Dutton. The Canadian Southern Railway Company was the first to put a track through southern Ontario from Windsor to Fort Erie in 1872. They sold to New York City Railway in 1882 and they leased it to the Michigan Central Railroad. The Lake Erie and Detroit River Railroad opened in 1901 from Walkersville to St. Thomas. It curved to reach places like Kingsville, Leamington, Blenheim, Erie Ridgetown Highgate, and West Lorne, which weren't covered by the MCR. It was meant to go further, but for reasons unclear, its progress was halted. The railways exchanged hands often, multiple times, because owners declared bankruptcy. That was how the Erie and Detroit Rail became part of the Flint and Pear Marquette Rail, and how Michigan Center was bought back by New York. Through all of their different names and owners, it was these two railroads that most impacted Dunwich and Aldborough. Some for better, some for worse, but for the towns we focus on today, it was their origin story. Rodney was hardly an idea when the Canadian Southern began construction. Their first ever train station was a modified boxcar manned by Charles Brown. The station that was later built on Stinson Street wasn't much better. Early trains were wood burning, so wood for fuel was stocked at all the stations. For Rodney, this came in the form of Port Glasgow's empty fish boxes piled on the station's side. There was lumber, livestock, fish, baskets, and beans, all key exports crowding the platform. The trains were bulky, ugly, and dangerous. It was only in the 1900s that electric block systems would prevent train-on-train collisions. Gatemen were placed at road crossings, but there just weren't enough. On January 1, 1934, local youth Carmen Evans, Georgina Monroe, Sarah Patterson, and Jean Stewart were hit by a train and killed while driving home from a New Year's Eve party. It was only after that tragedy that automated signals called wigwag signals were installed. It wasn't just the railroad safety that grew over time. When the Stinson Street station burned down in 1884, business had grown enough that the new station could be made bigger and better. The Lake Erie and Detroit River Railroad was added in 1901, their station at the Furnival Road crossing. The MCR doubled their track a year later, a project that took over 600 men and 125 new trains, some now with dining cars. In summer months, they sold excursion tickets to Toronto Daily and to the Erie Pavilions on Friday nights. There would be up to 16 passenger trains per day, per rail, through Rodney, with 20 cars each. Freight trains could easily have 100 cars. By 1904, trains from Niagara Falls to St. Thomas were traveling at world record speeds of 17 miles per hour. Of all that trains brought, one of their most valued imports was the news. The commercial telegraph was introduced almost as soon as the trains to cover provincial and federal elections. Imagine, voters gathered in the township hall, separated by political parties, chattering with excitement. Runners from the station dashed to the hall with information. An elected official's name is called. 
Half of the room is an uproar of cheers. The other half awaits the next name in simmering disappointment. It was almost as exciting as a game of hockey. West Lorne saw similar beginnings, although it was originally two towns around the railroad, Bismarck and Lorne. They went from two houses to communities with stores and hotels. The Commercial Hotel, Oddfellows Hall, and the Argyle Hotel popped up in the 1870s alongside stores for settlement necessities. The 1880s saw the rise of three mills, more stores, another hotel, and a bending factory. They built a town hall in 1888. The first train station was built in 1873 on what is now called Wellington Street. There were issues with its location, even though it had been built close to the tracks, so they moved it to Graham Street on the modern Erie flooring property. It stood vacant after trains fell out of favor until 1974. The old Pere Marquette station remains an unused shell. Bismarck was the name of a German chancellor at the time, and it was the condition of Squire Schleihoff, one of the two big names in the Westland area, when he donated the land that it be named after him. The other big name was MacKillop, a family who wanted to name the town after the Marquis of Lorne, Governor General of Canada, from 1878 to 1883. The name Lorne started slipping into other parts of the town, like the Lorne Mills, and when the two villages joined, that was the name that took root. Let's take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. The Bacchus Page House Museum is operated by the Triconnell Heritage Society, a volunteer organization that relies on donations, memberships, and volunteers. Please consider becoming a member. Through a membership, you receive regular mailings or emails, a vote at the annual general meeting, a membership card, recognition of your support on our website, and a charitable tax receipt in the amount of your membership fee. Our goal is to preserve and promote the history culture, and area surrounding the Bacchus Page House Museum within the Talbot Settlement for the greater community and future generations while celebrating the past. To get water to the trains, West Lorne originally pumped water from a well north of the station. It didn't yield enough water for track tanks, so they built a reservoir south of the town in 1901. In March 1960, the Pere Marquette Rail, here called Chesapeake in Ohio, had a devastating derailment near the Graham Road crossing. The train had a burnt journal on the sixth car. The journal box is also an axle box. It's the mechanical subassembly on each end of the axles under a railway wagon, coach, or locomotive. It's got bearings inside and it transfers the wagon, coach, or locomotive weight to the wheels and the rails and usually has oil bathed plain bearings inside it. Traveling at 60 miles per hour, bearings under the carriage also burnt out, knocking one of the tracks out of alignment and derailing the following cars. 32 loaded cars thrown forward, broke open, and piled up to three cars deep. Contents poured out. There was a creak of molasses, shopping bags, shale bricks, flour, briquettes, and grain. Police and customs officials arrived swiftly to prevent looting of anything left intact. The wreck brought a lot of attention to railroads and, shockingly, brought business to the village. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough business to stop railroads from becoming obsolete. Passenger trains stopped coming through West Lorne between the 1930s and early 50s. The tracks were removed in 1997. While Alderboro had the Rodney and West Lorne stations, two also were put into Dunwich Township, the first in what would become Dutton. The area was swamp, meaning tracks needed extra attention, and a small hamlet butted up around the workers. What trains did stop there unloaded in the middle of Main Street and left? The people wanted a proper station, but they were ignored by the railway and opposed by Wallacetown and Turconnell. Remember how I mentioned that there was a better and a worse? With Wallacetown and Turconnell relying on water shipped goods, they felt the railroad would impede on their business. Yet the Dutton people were stubborn, and with the hard work of David McClaws and Archibald John Leach, corporations had to concede. 
by making the people pay and provide materials for the train station. The land was donated by Neil Patterson, and once the station was built, Dutton prospered. Funnily enough, Dutton is not the name the settlers wanted. Half of them wanted to call it Lisgin, after the governor general. The other half wanted to name it after George Bennett, who distributed the land. A third party was brought in to decide, and the railroad company named Dutton after their chief engineer. The name was government approved in 1874 and attached to the post office, which was run by A.J. Leach. The main street is named after one of the first settlers, John Curry. A sawmill had been established in the 1850s, and as the hamlet grew, a grist mill was built by A. McEachern, which was turned into a flour mill by William Hollingshead and later sold to John E. Davies. In their time, the mills produced so much that they often had too few train cars to carry it all. Lots for other businesses were cleared and sold from 1872 onward, most moving from Wallacetown, Turconnell, and Iona. Hotels, doctors, druggists, lumber, and grain merchants, shoemakers, implement dealers, and tailors all set up shop in Dutton. The Baptist Church was the first religious organization to come in 1874, with the Methodists following a year later. By 1879, Dutton had 26 open places of business, and Angus McIntyre, the largest lumber exporter around, moved in and built a private bank. That building is now the old Bobier Convalescent Home, also known as Victoria Manor. Dunwich's other station was built near Iona, hence the name Iona Station, but the railway was too far out for the businesses to really benefit from it. Lots around the station were cleared in 1871, sold by 1873, but few could pay for new construction on top of that. This was a massive problem. The solution? Moving houses. Literally. They put their homes on rolling logs and tied their horses to massive pulleys, moving little by little to their lots. The dry goods and grocery store of James J. Campbell is reported to have taken a week to move. The building rolled so slowly that he kept it open the whole time. It stayed open until 1978 and also housed the post office. I believe this is also how Iona Station Baptist Church was moved onto its current location. Other buildings of note included Angus Graham's McIntyre Hotel. He married into the McIntyre family in 1873 and built on his mother-in-law's property not long after. It was his for three years until he moved back to Dutton, and the hotel changed hands and names often afterwards. Eventually, distance from the main road ruined the hotel business, and so it was converted into a store. It was used as such until it was destroyed by fire. There was also Ronald McDonald's house, which might make you think of fast food, but actually belonged to the town's first blacksmith and football coach. It was used as a blacksmith shop for over 90 years. There was also a massive well and water tower built by the railroad. It was known as Iona Station's most impressive feature. When it was first built, the water was pumped by hand, then by horse, and by the end, it was powered by an engine. It caught on fire once, and for fear of damage to the telegraph lines, a swift decision was made to tear the tower down. Almost as swift was the decision to build another one, and it was up so fast you would hardly know it had ever been gone. Perhaps the railroad's greatest enemies were fire and progress. Stations, water towers, mills, and so much else that fell to the flames tore holes in the budget and cut off production lines. Trains to Rodney closed off from 1930 to 1950 because of this, and further developed roads. When the 401 was built in 1973, Dutton faced exactly what had happened to Turconnell's port. It was faster to ship things by road, and passengers grew harder and harder to come by. The last train through Dutton left in 2005, ending the age of the railroad for both townships. Thank you for listening. I'd like to suggest visiting the Elgin County Railway Museum in St. Thomas, the railway city, to immerse yourself in all that is train-related. Come back next week as we delve into all the Talbot settlement firsts, like the first person to have a cook stove in our community, and more trivia. Please share the podcast with your friends and follow us on all social media platforms at Backus Page House. 
The Bacchus Page House Museum and Turconnell Heritage Society acknowledges the land we are on today as the traditional territory of First Nations people, the Attawandaran and the Iroquois. As settlers at a settler-focused museum, we value both the significant historical and contemporary contributions of all original peoples and ask how we can be supportive in Indigenous cultural renewal. Life in the Talbot Settlement is a production of Turcano Heritage Society, operators of Bacchus Page House Museum, funded by the Department of Canadian Heritage. Your host has been Angela Bobier. Music provided by Jack Whitmer. Thanks to our producer, Caitlin Reitzma. To make a charitable donation and to contact the Bacchus Page House Museum, visit our website, www.bacchuspagehouse.ca. And thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.